Welcome to Jabber's Gospel Thoughts and more Old Testament. So, we continue today in the third and final part of the Solomon cycle or the story of King Solomon, son of David. And this is the 50th episode of this podcast. I can't believe I've made 50 of these so far. I never thought, uh, to be honest, that I would make it this far and uh, still be excited about it but I am and I you know love doing these so the trick is to figure out the right format I guess but this is lesson 50 and so we're talking about King Solomon and we stopped yesterday at chapter 10 where Solomon receives the Queen of Sheba and it's sort of, she's sort of a witness to Solomon's wisdom and wealth. She's this foreign witness. The author, it's as if the author of First Kings is saying, well, if you don't believe Solomon was that great, then look up the account of the Queen of Sheba. Now, where is Sheba? Sheba in Arabic, we say Seba. It's the it's a kingdom in Yemen in southern Arabia. Uh, the story is actually mentioned in the Quran. Muslims believe, and they, they have this account of the visit between the Queen of Sheba and and Solomon. The Ethiopians, uh, Ethiopian Jews, and Ethiopian Christians believe that uh, the Queen of Sheba um, and uh, King Solomon. And her name in Arabic, they call her Balqis. They, they believe that they had relations. And that's where the Ethiopian African Jews come from. And the story is mentioned in uh, an Ethiopian uh, Bible called the Kherbanagast. And that's another thing. But that is the Queen of Sheba. So there, the author of First Kings is trying to say, the kingdom was that great and the evidence is the queen of Sheba. But that's not the thing that concerns me uh, most here. I mean, I can dwell on this story uh, a little bit, but there are two things that happen towards the end of the chapter where it talks in, in verse 26 and 27 and 28, where it talks about the chariots and horsemen and and uh, he had all of these chariots, which was state-of-the-art weaponry at the time. Uh, but And then in verse 27, the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones and cedars made to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. So they had an abundance of resources, but as a trained economist, uh, the reference to silver case uh, uh, gets, to, gets to me because when there is abundance of a precious metal which is your currency that means not only that the price of everything goes up because of inflation because there is a lot of money chasing limited amounts of goods even though it seems they had lots of goods especially cedar trees which were more than sycamore trees uh, but that still causes inflation and above all it causes financial speculations and uh, that that harm the economy so th that that gives you a hint about the situation in Solomon's days at least the socio-economic situation I suspect that, that there was the start of, of corruption financial corruption and, and that sort of stuff they had horses etc etc so chapter 11 and and, and Chapter 10 leads to this. Chapter 11 is when Solomon marries, starts building those political alliances. Again, reliance on the arm of the flesh. You read chapter 10, you read chapter 9, it's all of this wealth, all of this military buildup, all of this uh, silver and gold and everything. And just Solomon goes more and more after more power and more wealth. So he marries. 700 wives and 300 concubines around a thousand ladies in his in his harem now of course any serious student of the ancient near east would know that this these marriages you give you give the title uh, of, uh, of uh, queen to a woman from a different tribe or a different nation so you build a political alliance so the the purpose of these marriages 
for the most part, I believe, was to build political alliances and expand in a peaceful way and have influence with these nations, e economic influence, political influence, military influence, using these marriages. Because once you're connected with family ties, uh, then that gives you some sort of peace. That's how they did it in those days. We can't hold it against them. That was the society they knew and understood. We can't judge them by our 21st century standards. Indeed, the successor to Solomon, still the house of David, Rehoboam, who will be the subject of the next episode, is a son of an Ammonite. An Ammonite, basically the, those people lived in what's today Jordan. They lived in a place called Rabat Amun, which is today's Amman, the capital of the kingdom of Jordan. So she was not Jewish, but the point that this chapter is making is that he married all of these women, but it's not the marriages. It's what the marriages indicate. The marriages were with these women who worshipped different gods. And sure enough, when you have a thousand women around you with their and their children, who you can't raise yourself, you can't pay attention to them and raise them to worship and believe as you believe, the, these women will have more influence on the children than you are, and they will have influence on you. So the result was... Uh, and, and the story is told here in a very dramatic way. Uh, he basically starts, uh, he cleaves, in verse 2, he cleaves to these women uh, in love. And they, in verse 3, turn away his heart. Turn away his heart uh, from whom? From God. And after other gods, as it says uh, specifically in verse 4, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So David lived and died uh, believing in the one true God. Solomon, unfortunately, did not do that. And uh, for, for the past, I don't know, five, six years, I've, I've read Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and uh, uh, Song of Songs, Every day, pretty much every day uh, for the last, I think, five years. Uh, every day. I, I don't think I've missed a day. I have an app that tracks it. Not to brag, but I, I read them because I love the wisdom that is in there. The wisdom about worshiping God, about how to raise your children, about how to not follow after women, how to not follow after the desires of your heart. And many of these, as we will study later, are written uh, allegedly by Solomon. But then you look at the later part of his life and it's he he just doesn't follow his own advice. He is this wise guy, this... Uh, amazingly intelligent uh, person. Apparently his wisdom surpassed many of the sages of Jude earlier stages of Judaism and the people who lived during his time, but yet his heart strayed from God. As I said in the second or third episode of this podcast, uh, in those days uh, monotheism was, was a strange thing for people of the ancient Near East. They worshipped multiple gods and it, it, the idea of loyalty to one god was very strange. So they worshipped whoever god they perceived was giving them luck, victory, etc. And fortune. And Solomon apparently fell into that trap. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is, even if you are as wise as Solomon, when you get power, when you get wealth, when you get both, when you get comfortable, you are easily... Satan will easily lead you away from looking at God and worshiping God. What we will see in the rest of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles are just a repetition of 1 and 2 Kings, and I'll probably do a brief thing about them later on. But the whole purpose is to show you first how the United Kingdom was separated and then how the Kingdom of Israel, which is the Northern Kingdom, from the very beginning they worship uh, basically idols and they, they fall, they don't listen to warnings and they end up going into diaspora, they go into exile. And then the kingdom of Judah, they go through cycles in the kingdom of Judah. They have good and bad kings. But it all starts here. It all starts with Solomon because here is the thing. 
the more respected you are, the more you're put on a pedestal. You're Solomon. If you've allowed yourself to commit abira, as they say in Hebrew, to commit a sin, uh, then people, the next generation, would look at you and say, well, if it was good for my father, Solomon, then it's okay if I do it a little bit. It's okay if I do it for, for some political expediency, to build my power, to do this, to do that. And you don't trust God to save you, to bless you, to be with you. That is the lesson we learn from Solomon. And I think all of the exaggeration about his wealth and wisdom earlier on in this book is aimed at this, is to show you his fall and his, the end of his days and that no one is immune. No one is immune. And But it started with Solomon. It started with this one person. And I look today, and I'll be completely frank and honest about this, and uh, sort of vulnerable a little bit, uh, and reveal a little bit about my thinking about things, is what really disappoints and makes me sad are people who have the heritage of the gospel in their lives, the people who believe, and the people who end up relinquishing that legacy, and following, so to speak, after other gods, after other philosophies, <clears throat> excuse me, after other ideas, and they relinquish that even a little bit. Uh, once, once we go down that path, then we're opening, we're opening it for the next generation to lose their way. So we have to be as perfect of an example as humanly as we can be and live the commandments, live the gospel, live the teachings, uh, to the best of our ability and be vulnerable with with our next generation about our mistakes when we make them because that's the only way we will keep the next generation in uh, in the gospel uh, because it seems to me that it is a, a, a tremendous waste of of legacy squandering legacy so to speak when we relinquish the gospel with small acts uh, it's it's really very sad to me. Anyway, that's I, I usually try not to go into a dorash, uh, 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 sort of a lecture about this, but this is a topic that's tender to my heart these days and uh, makes my heart tender these days because it, it's happening, unfortunately, and everywhere I look, I can trace it. I can trace it to the earlier generation that, that let things split, slip a little way. Or someone who's letting it slip for their children now. Um, we need to be strong and stay strong in the gospel. And that's the only way we can avoid the mistakes of Solomon. So Solomon now, the Lord is, is uh, expressing in verse 9, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. So people who tell you, I need evidence, I need to see the Lord, I need to see an angel, I need to see the miracle. Here is Solomon, not only wisdom, but he, he saw, he communed with the Lord twice. Twice. So, and he, he's not a, a priest, he's not a Levite, he, he is not from a priestly line. Uh, he's from the kingly line, so to speak, but he doesn't have any priesthood uh, authority in in the in the uh, church organization, so to speak, in the Jewish uh, organization, and still he fails. And he worships other gods, and they list them, and uh, he he basically in. Uh, in verse 10 it says, and commanded him concerning this thing. So the Lord is saying, I told him specifically about this, that he should not go after other God, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. He did not keep it. So in verse 13, he says, how about I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. The Lord will always fulfill his promises to us. Uh, even when we fail. So the Lord said, I'm going to keep a part of the kingdom with uh, one part of it, one tribe with you for the sake of David, but everyone else will, will, be, will be taken out. And the Lord, so then starting in verse 14, we see 
uh, all of these adversaries showing out of the woods as if to start knocking down everything that Solomon and David before him built. So the, we start with this man. His name is Hadad. He's an Edomite. Uh, then we start with, then we have uh, another adversary in verse 23. His name is Rizan, the son of Eliada. Uh, and he is from another nation. Uh, and then in verse 25, it says he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, besides the mischief that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. So you have all of these people shown from the woodwork, from the outside of Israel, but then, and Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, a key figure that we will talk about at length later on, uh, an Ephratite of uh, Zarida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeroah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. So here is this person who comes, he's an Ephratite, uh, he's someone of very low birth, he's the son of a widow, someone who's socioeconomically very low, even he were started raising his hand against the king. And this was, uh, and then they tell you the cause of him lifting up his hand against the king, it had to do with taxes with uh, with building up cities Solomon invoked all of these building projects and uh, this is this had to do with with building basically Jeroboam Jeroboam wouldn't and we will talk about this later I apologize about this I wanted to talk about him later and then I started talking about him but we will talk about him when we talk about the breakup of the United Kingdom uh, next time. But uh, there is this prophet Ahijah or Ahijah, uh, the brother of Jah. His name means Jah is my brother, Jehovah is my brother. Caught the, he walks with Jeroboam, this man of lowly birth, and uh, found him and he gives him it, here is this garment theme again. Ahijah asked for his garment and he said to Jeroboam, he, he takes the garment, he rents it in 12 pieces. So remember, the garment is a, a symbol of power, authority, etc., as I said in many podcasts earlier. And he says to Jeroboam in verse 31, uh, take the 10 pieces. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will rent the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten tribes to thee. So Jeroboam is anointed. Remember, the prophets in, in ancient Israel had to anoint the king. The, the, the prophet had to have a hand in anointing the king. So because it is the Lord who decided that, was always a reminder that the king isn't king by his own power. He's anointed by a prophet through the Lord. And uh, and so he tells him, you're going to be a ruler over ten tribes. And that is the story in, in the next time. And then he tells him why he's taking the kingdom away from Solomon, which is because of the idol worship. Now, uh, then there is, uh, there is this verse 41, and you will see it. Uh, frequently in the books of first and second kings every time they conclude talking about the king and they started here in in with Solomon in verse 41 it says and the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom are they not written in the book of acts of Solomon so I always like to underline these in my scriptures because it tells you about other scriptures that we do not have one day maybe we will find them but the writing of scriptures has has always been an ongoing activity in ancient Israel. So uh, the, you will see this after the mention of every king. And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. So again, this is the number 40, the same number of years that his father David reigned. But notice uh, Solomon dies at 60 years of age. He doesn't go to 70. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. We will talk about Rehoboam next time. But again, the lessons from Solomon. Solomon was a great king. He had an amazing hiatus, established this uh, massive kingdom, great wealth, great power. But he eventually followed other gods and fell. 
And that is the seed of what, in my opinion, it's the seed of everything that will happen next. So we'll see you next time. We'll talk about the breakup of the United Kingdom and the reign of Rehoboam. Thank you for watching.